Hey, before the video starts, I just want to say thank you for your support. My first video was a huge success, and those of you who haven't seen it, if you like Pikmin, I think you will enjoy it. I appreciate it so much that you guys really showed support for what I do, and I hope you enjoy this video as well. Thank you! You know, as I'm recording this, it has been in the single digits for a couple weeks, and there's been snow and ice on the ground for at least three of them. I miss summer. I miss the warm weather, the happy flowers, and the sunshine. I also miss going outside without Mother Nature trying to kill me. You know what? I'm gonna have a nice tropical getaway. One hour later. Oh crap, oh crap, oh crap, this is not what I had in mind. Monster Hunter World is a beautiful game. Even seven years later, it looks gorgeous. When this is released, Monster Hunter Wilds will only be a few weeks away, so I would like to take this opportunity to revisit this classic. I want to talk about the incredible thought put into the landscaping and flora of this game. In order to really appreciate this game's botanical achievements, we're gonna have to learn a bit about plant classifications. And if that sounds really boring, don't worry, I will be using the plants in this game to explain them. Let's get some categories going. First off, Vascular versus non-vascular. Vascular plants have, well, a vascular system. This includes xylem, which transports nutrients and water up the stem, and a phloem, which transports sugars and leaves down to the roots. They're taller than the non-vasculars, like mosses and liverworts. Vascular plants can be separated into two groups, seedless and seeded. The difference is, uh, pretty self-explanatory. Seedless plants are things like horsetails and ferns, and they reproduce from spores. Seeded plants, well, they reproduce from seeds. There are two types of plants that produce seeds, gymnosperms and angiosperms. You're very familiar with both of these groups, even if you don't know it. Gymnosperms are evergreens, sago palms, and ginkgos, and angiosperms are anything with a flower. Angiosperms, or flowering plants, have two different types. Monocots are plants that usually have three petals, parallel veins in their leaves, scattered vascular bundles, the xylem and phloem, and the biggest difference, when the seed sprouts, it sends up one baby leaf called a cotyledon. Eudicots, also known as dicots, have four or five petals, vascular bundles and rings, nut-like veins in their leaves, and they get to have two cotyledons. One more way we can separate plants is if they're monoecious or dioecious. These are super easy. Monoecious means the male and female reproductive organs are on one plant, and dioecious means they're on separate plants. A good way to remember it is that mono means one and di means two. Okay, that's all we need to start sorting out some plants. Not too bad, right? This plant is a crazy looking one, but it may look familiar to a lot of you. This is a beautiful cycad. These are in the family Cycadaceae, and the only genus in this family is Cycus. This one right here happens to be a female cycad. We know this by the big fluffy part between the leaves. That's a female cone. Yeah, that's right, it's a cone. This is a dioecious gymnosperm. Here we have a plant from the Ericaceae family. This is the palm family. Everyone loves a good palm tree, especially when drinking from a coconut on a secluded island getaway. Palm trees are angiosperms. They have tiny bright yellow flowers that grow on a long stalk called an inflorescence. We can't quite tell if this one is monoecious or dioecious though, palms can be either one. They're also monocots. This means if you cut a palm tree down, it won't have annular rings. I'm sure many of you have seen a tree stump and saw all those little rings. Well, those rings represent years of growth for the tree and are formed by the vascular tissues. Because of the irregularity of the vascular tissues, the palm tree doesn't grow out so much as up. In fact, the tallest monocot in the world is the Candia wax palm and it can get as tall as 197 feet. The largest seed belongs to Coco de Mer, and they can be 16 to 20 inches around and weigh 33 to 66 pounds. Raffia palms have the largest leaves in the world, being 82 feet long and 10 feet wide. The largest inflorescence is found in the genus Corypha. All in all, a word I would use to describe Ericaceae is big. This plant looks like a palm, but it's not. This is actually a fern. This is Saphiropterus medullaris, the black tree fern. You can tell it isn't a palm by the bark around the tree. Compare the two and you see that the palm has a much smoother trunk than the trunk of the tree fern. They're in the Polypodiopsida class, 
the fern class. While they are vascular, they reproduce by spores and not seeds. This here is an herb, a member of the herb family, which includes ivy and antidote herb. This is kind of a stranger looking plant, and this is also one that doesn't quite exist in our world. Let's see what we can determine by looking at it though. First of all, it appears to be an angiosperm. An interesting part about the herb puddles is their green pigment. Most flowers are brighter colors, not green. This is to attract different pollinators. Many of the green flowers in the world have been bred that way to look good to us, not the bugs and the birds. We can also tell this is a monocot. This is due to the petals again. It has three petals on its flowers. Remember, eudicots have four or five, so herbs are a monocot. Irregular vascular patterns and one cotyledon. So does this have a real life counterpart? Well, I would put it in the Tradescantia genus, specifically with the spider warts. They have very similar leaves and flowers. This strange plant right here is actually another cycad, specifically Cycus zelantia. You can tell this by the fact that it has branches and not just a straight trunk. These lighter green plants are actually part of a genus called Pistia. These are also known as water lettuce. It's an angiosperm and a monocot. It's in the Araceae family, which are famous for having a type of flower called a spadix. This is the same type of flower on a spathophyllum, or peace lily. The white petal looking part is called the spathe, and the center yellow portion is called the spadix. Okay, what the heck is this alien looking thing? Well, this is actually an echocetum, or horsetail. You can tell by its very prominent tip called a strobilis, and its small leaves that go around the stalk in a complete circle. This plant is vascular, but it lacks seeds. This means it reproduces via spores. This here is a more strange looking plant. This is a plant in the Heliconia genus, and I believe it to be Heliconia restrata. These are also called lobster claws because of the strange shape of its flowers, which are monaceous. They are monocots, and they can grow up to 15 feet tall, so this is a pretty accurate representation of one. Many of these plants are listed as vulnerable in the wild, but they are grown in tropical climates as a decorative plant quite consistently. Also, their main pollinators are hummingbirds, and I just think that's adorable. Oh, hey, look, a fern! I love ferns! They're in the class Polypodiopsida, like the Saphiropterus from before. These guys, like Echocetum, are vascular, but don't have flowers or seeds. Instead, they reproduce by spores found on the undersides of the mature leaves. As you can see, these ferns are growing on the side of a rock. This makes them lithophytes, which simply means they grow on stone. Many plants are lithophytes, actually, including some orchid species and mosses, but we'll get to them later. Moving on, we have another item in the game, the needleberry family. These are actually described as being a nut. Here's the thing though, the leaf pattern of this plant suggests a monocot. This is strange because monocots can't grow true nuts, and here's why. Monocots can't have woody tissues. Nuts are seeds surrounded by a woody shell, so if a monocot can't produce wood, it can't produce a nut. Okay, here's a fun one. Bryophytes? and lichens. Bryophyte is the fancy name for moss, and I love moss. They're so tiny and cute, and their spore capsules are really cool looking. As you can guess, these are non-vascular. You can tell by their size. These cool little guys are found pretty much everywhere, from the Arctic to the desert. They're cool in that they can grow where many plants can't. This is because they lack the root system that other vascular plants need for water uptake. And if you have an abundance of house plants, like I do, then you owe bryophytes a lot. They're what make up the soilless media you're using for your plants. Peat moss. Now, I used another word there, lichens. A lichen is actually a type of fungus though. They have a symbiotic relationship with cyanobacteria and these little guys are everywhere. And I mean that. They're in the Arctic, they're in deserts, they're in rainforests. They're found on rocks, trees, pretty much any stationary thing outside with a porous surface isn't safe from these little guys. So we have these big leafy plants that are great for hiding in. These big guys appear to be related to a type of plant called a hosta. They're monocots and in the Asparagaceae family. If that name sounds a little familiar, yes, this is the asparagus family. And hostas are also edible and used often in Asian cuisine. But how do we know these are in Asparagaceae? 
Well, they have their leaves very tight together at the base, which is a big trait for this family. Okay, this guy is really cool. This is a bromeliad in the family Bromeliaceae. You can tell by the long, flat, serrated leaves that sit pretty much on top of each other. I adore bromeliads, mostly because one of my favorite fruits, the pineapple, is one. I love them so much, I have one. So here we see this big guy is growing on a tree. This is actually pretty common for this family. This means there's something called an epiphyte. They don't need soil and grow on other plants. Trees, usually. There are also some that grow in the soil as well, like the deliciousness that is the pineapple. These guys are monocots, and they get absolutely gorgeous flowers on them. So this guy is pretty interesting. His leaf and his flower shape are exactly like those of the Protea. This looks to be more specifically Protea cyneroides, or the king Protea. It's obviously an angiosperm, but is it a monocot or a eudicot? Well, this is a eudicot. We can tell by the flower. See that big white part in the middle? It's actually a collection of really tiny flowers, and the pink parts are called bracts. They aren't petals, but instead they're a modified leaf. This is also seen in poinsettias. The large red petals are actually just leaves, and the flowers are the tiny yellow parts in the very center. Red bits are pretty interesting. They're used to sling your ammo. This is obviously an angiosperm due to the fact that you're throwing a fruit. I believe it to be a monocot because it has those longer leaves so close together with the flower stalk coming from the middle. It's hard to find an example of this from our world, but I would compare it to perhaps the family Amaryllidaceae, or the Amaryllis family. They grow from a bulb underground most of the time and have berries that look like and are arranged very similarly to this red pit. This is a beautiful plant with majestic drooping flowers, and I believe it to be Alpenia zarumbet, commonly known as shell ginger. The leaf structure and the flowers are very similar. This makes them for sure an angiosperm and a monocot. You can tell by the leaves in their arrangement. This plant in the real world is actually used as a medicinal herb and food source in Southeast Asia. Here we have a gorgeous flower fern. These and their relatives, the fire herb, snow herb, and sleep herb, are all angiosperms, and they appear to have a witty stem. This makes them a eudicot. One thing I absolutely love about these designs is the fact that it has a close resemblance to Albizia gilibrisin, the mimosa tree. They are in the fabulous Fabaceae family. This is the family of plants that have beans. Huh, what are the scout flights do? Oh God, no, why, why? Please leave me alone, please leave me alone, please leave me alone. I don't want to die today. I'm just looking at plants, I swear. <sighs> Okay, I think we lost him. I think we're good. Oh, I'm just gonna ignore that. Um, okay, look, there's another one. There's another one. I found it. We're safe. Uh, hopefully we're safe. Ahem. <clears throat> if the name Mimosa sounds familiar, you may recognize it for the scientific name Mimosa pudica, or sensitive plant. This is the plant that shuts its leaves rapidly when touched. However, these plants are only related in family. They just happen to look very similar. Oh, look, another bromeliad. This is a knollberry used to cure elemental blights. This is a classic bromeliad in its fruiting stage. It closely resembles bromelia penguin. No, not penguin, penguin. It's also called wild pineapple. Both have that classic bromeliad shape, slightly serrated leaves that grow tightly together and cluster fruits. Not only do bromeliads spread via seed, but they also create pups from their base. This tree's pretty interesting looking. It's an angiosperm, and you can tell because it's deciduous. This means it loses its leaves in the winter. Gymnosperms don't do this, except for one tree called Ginkgo biloba. It's clearly a eudicot because it has woody tissues. Strangely enough, it has yellow and orange leaves though, yet it's summertime. So what causes those red and yellow colors? Well, it's a combination of two pigments called carotenoids and anthocyanins. Carotenoids are actually present in the plant all the time. You aren't able to see their vibrant yellows, though, because the pigment of the chlorophyll is too strong, and for good reason. Chlorophyll is actually what's doing the photosynthesizing for the plant. Anthocyanins are produced by the plant in times of stress, or at the end of the growing season when the chlorophylls are dying, as the plant prepares for winter. So this plant is either in trouble or about to go dormant. The vital lilies are an important part of this ecosystem. They provide healing to the hunter and other creatures like the palicos. You can see the reproductive portion in this flower, specifically prominent stamens, which are the male reproductive organs. You can easily see the anthers, which hold the pollen, and filaments, which hold the anthers. However, you can't see any female reproductive organs in this plant. 
making it dioecious. My guess is that these are monocots due to their leaves all growing from the very base of the plant and being tightly packed together, as well as the flowers. This flower also perhaps comes from some kind of bulb due to the arrangement of the leaves so close to the ground and sprouting so close together. Oh, here's a fun plant. It appears to be some sort of plant in the genus Tillandsia, most likely Tillandsia eusneoides, or Spanish moss. Believe it or not, this is another type of bromeliad. They're in the same family as the knollberry and the large bromeliads we saw earlier, so they're monocots. They're also epiphytes growing on trees and sometimes even telephone lines in the real world. Scatter nuts are also used as ammo in your slinger. Now upon closer investigation, it appears that it isn't a true nut. It looks like there's a fruit on the outside layer of the seed, or seeds. Because we can see that the fruit has two indentations, this leads me to believe there's two seeds. Here's where things get rough. Normally this is the part where I tell you they're actually a stone fruit, like a peach or a plum, but those can't grow on vines, and neither do normal nuts, so this is kind of a weird one. It's clearly an angiosperm, and the vines appear to be woody, so I'd place them as eudicots. We don't see any flowers, so we can't quite tell if it's monoecious or dioecious, though. Okay, this has to be one of my favorite plants in the game, because it's based on one of my favorite plants in real life. The poison cup is clearly a species of Nepenthes, or pitcher plant. This plant appears to be a eudicot because it looks like it has woody tissues, just like real Nepenthes that are older, so I feel comfortable putting them in this category. In this game, when you attack the plant, it spills poison all over the ground, damaging both the hunter and the monster. In Nepenthes, those traps contain acidic substances. When insects fall into the pitcher, they're digested and absorbed by the plant, giving it the valuable nutrients it needs. Another cool thing about this plant is it's dioecious, so there's male plants and female plants. This here is actually a fern, believe it or not. This is what the fronds look like before they've unfurled. It's called a fiddlehead, named because it looks like the head of a violin. There's quite a few varieties that are edible and used in cuisines from East Asia and North America. So, I never noticed this in the game until I was recording footage to review. There are Pinophyta here! So we have yet another gymnosperm in this area of the game. Pinophyta is the conifer or evergreen phylum. This appears to be something like Arucaria aracana, the monkey puzzle tree. You can tell by the very short needles and the arrangement of the branches which tend to bend upwards. This is a pretty cool aquatic plant. This appears to be Cypress papyrus. You're probably more familiar with its species name than its genus if you studied ancient Egypt. That's right, this is the papyrus that was used to make ancient paper. This plant is a monocot, and it typically grows in these very wet conditions. Thank you for joining me on this botanical expedition through the ancient forest of the New World. I really hope you enjoyed watching this one as much as I enjoyed making it. I had so much fun playing detective and trying to figure out what plants could possibly be. You can tell the game developers put a lot of thought and effort into their designs, which is why I wanted to point them out. The plants in the background often get ignored as just pieces to elevate the atmosphere. This is just proof that game designers and artists need more appreciation. Because, like I said, this game is still absolutely stunning seven years later. Thank you so much for watching. If you enjoyed this little endeavor, please subscribe and turn on notifications so you don't miss my next video. Also, please like and leave a comment. It really does mean the world to me to hear from you guys. Leave me suggestions for games you think have interesting flora in them or any topics you would like to see covered. Again, thanks for watching, and I will see you next time.